All right, good morning, everyone. It is always a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to preach the gospel this morning. And uh, I am thankful for this opportunity. And also, I am grateful for your prayers and thoughts uh, for uh, my son's illness. And we're just praying and hoping that everything will, will be OK. Uh, this morning, we're going to take our message from, uh, what, hold on one second, I need my, um, so we're going to take our message from the book of uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 11, Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 11. And the Bible says, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I want to focus in on that last part there in the verse where John writes, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created created. When you look up the word sovereignty, God's sovereignty, you'll see in the dictionary, uh, it gives a definition of supreme power or supreme authority. Most people, when they think about the sovereignty of God, they usually just say God is God all by himself and besides him there is no other. But the word really means that God is supreme and God has power and authority over everything. Now, everything that we that is going on in the world today, uh, sometimes it can be confusing. Uh, sometimes we may not understand why certain things happen the way they happen. Sometimes we look around in this world and we seem uh, helpless uh, because of the circumstances. But I want to encourage everyone today to always remember that God is still on the throne and that God is still God and God is sovereign over all the earth. And so as we think about this idea of God being sovereign and God creating all things for his pleasure, I want to discuss with you this morning three divine institutions. Three divine institutions. Now, when I say divine Institutions, I mean it is ordained by God. Institutions, I'm talking about the system of things. And the first divine institution that was ordained by God is the family. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And a part of that creation, God created human beings. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, uh, let us make man in our image. And God, in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, both male and female created he them. Now, as God created the human being, he created man and woman, and they were commanded that they were to have children. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, and God blessed them. And he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, part of this divine institution that is ordained by God, God has certain roles. He has certain expectations and responsibilities for each person that's a part of this divine institution. For example, the husband is told that he should love his wife in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. The wife is told that she should respect her husband in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Even the children are given a command. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now the family, as instituted by God in the beginning, is one of the most important divine institutions ordained by God. 
I say that because our families that we come from, the families that you live in, the families that we have, our families laid a foundation for our society. You see, our children grow up in our home. They leave the home and then go out into the world and they make families themselves. And Satan knows this. And so therefore, Satan, what he tries to do is to attack the family. We see him infiltrating and attacking the family in the very beginning. The Bible says that Cain killed Abel. You see that anger and that uh, 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 malice that one brother had toward another is how Satan influences the household. So we have to be careful in our families, is what I'm trying to say this morning. As we think about how we allow the world to come into our families and influence our families on how we um, exercise those roles and responsibilities and expectations that God has for us. We must understand that Jesus gives us the foundation about how we should live our lives and also how we should conduct ourselves in our families. Satan does us no good. Make no mistake about it. Even Jesus says in John 10 and verse 10, for the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come that you may have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So we have to make a decision for ourselves as parents, as grandparents, as someone who may be caretaking a child. How are we going to allow the influence of God to be first and foremost in our families rather than the influence of Satan? Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. You see, the home is where it starts. Our children should learn about God, not from the schools, not from society, not from their friends, but our children should learn about God first in the home. Notice in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So I hope you have your Bibles today because we'll be turning and looking at some verses there in the scripture to illustrate some points. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. And the point I'm making right now is that it starts in the home. That's what we first learn about God. Our parents serve as a representation of who God is for us as children. But notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 6. Moses says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on the gates." So this whole idea, what what were they to teach their children? Well, you go back in verse number four, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And so the home is the first divine institution ordained by God. And within the home, God has uh, certain roles and expectations and responsibilities for each person in the home. Now, Satan knows that if he can move the family away from God, then he can move society away from God. And ultimately, he can move the church away from God. But that's the first divine institution ordained by God. The second divine institution ordained by God is the government. Now, the government, uh, there is what the word, there is built into the word, the definition, the govern, right? That's what the word govern, 
government mean? It means that there are laws and rules and regulations to regulate our behavior in society. And I submit to you today that that is ordained by God. It is seen early on in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 after the flood when Noah said, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. Now this commandment that Noah gave was not, was not just for his family, but it was for all of society. We see that carried over in the Ten Commandments where the, uh, Moses writes, thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. We see the same thing over in the New Testament where we are commanded not to do that to one another, not to murder each other. Also, when you look around in our society today, that governmental rule still applies Today, for all of us understand, we are not to take another person's life. So God had established a rule, a system to regulate the behaviors of society all the way back in Genesis chapter 9. Imagine the world where there were no government. A lot of people scoff at the idea of government. But imagine if there was or there were no government. Uh, everything would be chaos. We see that happening in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 21 and 25, the Bible says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So today we must know and understand that government is a part of God's divine design. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but God. The powers that be are ordained by God. That's what Paul is talking about, the government. We have a responsibility. Peter talks about that, talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. It's all through the Bible. Now, I want to make a point. I guess I'll make it now uh, here. I'm not saying that every, when I say the government is ordained, is a divine institution ordained by God, we understand that certain governmental structures are corrupt and they mistreat people and they abuse people, and they do people wrong. I'm not saying that God has ordained that. You see, that happens when man gets involved and man corrupts the system. I'm talking about the idea that there is a system or a structure of laws to regulate our behavior in society. That's ordained by God. And as Christians today, as people of God, we have to understand that our responsibility is to be Good citizens. Uh, look, look in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 17. Jesus even deals with this as he talks to his disciples. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 17 through 21, the Bible says, Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought to him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar. Then he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So we have a responsibility to obey the laws of the land, as long as they don't violate God's law, of course. It's always, uh, as, as the Bible says in Acts, it is better to obey God than man. But if it's a, a regulation that is instituted by the government and it does not violate God's law, then it's our responsibility as Christians, people of God, to obey those laws. 
We must not forget the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar led the Babylonians and they took the children of Israel into captivity. And one of the first captives, captives that they took into uh, captivity was uh, uh, Daniel. Right? And Daniel had the ability to interpret dreams. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32 there. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand what the dream meant. So he came to Daniel and he says, Daniel, can you interpret this dream for me? And Daniel said to him in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32, he says, what this dream means is that the people are going to drive you from me and, and your dwelling, that is your way of life, shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you eat the grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. And sure enough, exactly what uh, Daniel said is what happened. For a whole year, Nebuchadnezzar lived out in the wild, and he ate grass off the ground. And what did Daniel say there in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32? He said, this is going to happen to you until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. So we must not make any mistake about it. God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And oftentimes, people get worried. People are fearful, especially during, during a political season as we are in now. Uh, and yes, we have to do our part, but we must not forget that God is still in control. And things may not look the way we want them to look all the time. Things may not turn out the way we want them to turn out all the time. But one thing we must not forget is that God is sovereign and is our responsibility to obey God and to obey the law. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers to obey magistrates and to be ready for every good work. You know, if there's one thing we should do in a time like this is we ought to pray. That's what we ought to do. That's what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible tells us that we ought to pray in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. I exhort ye, therefore, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for those that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So the first divine institution is the family. Second divine institution ordained by God is the government. And the third divine institution ordained by God is the church. The church has always been a part of God's plan since the beginning. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul writes, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus the Lord. The church is not an afterthought. The church is not just a contingency plan because people rejected Jesus. God knew that he wanted to establish a church through Jesus Christ from the foundation of the world. When John saw Jesus coming afar off in John chapter 1 and verse 29, John says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So we must understand, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, what we are doing today is a part of God's eternal plan since the beginning. And the good thing about it for us is that we are living in an age where we have the complete revelation of God. We live in a time in which the prophets 
look toward that one day will be, would be. We live in a time where uh, Jesus has already sacrificed himself on the cross. And now we have direct access to the throne of God. We live in a great time. We are living in an age that the Bible talks about that one day would come. But make no mistake about it, this is not an accident that this institution is here today. The church has always been a part of God's plan. And during the ministry of Jesus, Jesus laid the foundation for the church. And the church was built upon the foundation of the confession of Peter. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, and his disciples said unto him, whom do, and Jesus said unto them, whom do men say that I am? And his disciples said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah. And some say that you are the prophet Jeremiah. Then Jesus answered them and said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said unto them, thou art the Christ, the son of of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed be thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church was established when Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb and he rose again on the third day. And we read about that in Acts chapter 2, about the first gospel sermon preached and people obeying the gospel. That was the beginning and that has always been a part of God's eternal divine plan. Now, the thing about the church is that uh, the church is the same, or at least should be the same, because God has a universal design for the church. You can go anywhere, and if you follow the Bible, then you're going to come out with the same thing. No addition, no subtraction. You take this book. We all have the same book. If you follow what's written in this book, we all going to do the same thing. We all going to be the same thing. That's a part of God's design. I want to show you something here. Plain white cake. Any bakers in here? Anybody know how to bake? Any bake? Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, plain white cake. You see the plain white cake. Now, now you take this recipe. Doesn't matter if you're here in San Jose or you go on the other side of the world. You take this recipe and you take these ingredients. You're going to come out with the same thing. You're going to come out with a plain white cake. Now, let, let's stop for a minute now. Look at, the, look at the ingredients. One cup of white sugar. Now, I didn't say brown sugar. I said white sugar. One cup. I didn't say two cups. I said one cup. White sugar. You got a half a cup of unsalted butter. I want you two large chicken eggs. And they, they got a lot of eggs you can get. Got ostrich eggs, snake eggs, frog eggs. You can go. You want two chicken eggs. I want you to take two teaspoons of vanilla extract. And they got a lot of different kinds of extract. You got lemon extract. I'm not talking about lemon. I'm not talking about coconut. You take your two teaspoons of vanilla extract. We understand this, right? This is easy. It's kind of humorous to us because we see how simple the recipe is, right? You want you to get you one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. Now make sure you sift the flour. So if you if you go into the if you don't know if you go in there and you just get you a cup of flour and you put it in the bowl and start mixing, you probably may end up having more, right? So you got to sift it out and, and to get the the one and a half cups there. You wonder why sometimes you make a cake you wonder why it's so heavy because you use too much flour, okay? So you got to make sure you sift the flour first, but you use one and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one and three-fourths te uh, teaspoons of baking powder, all right? You want to do that to help the cake to rise. And you got a half a cup of milk. Now, I'm not talking about 
we're talking about cow's milk. Not buttermilk, not almond milk, but cow's milk. Now, now, why do I have this up here for you? Because I want you to understand that it's just that simple when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all understand that if we do the same thing, we're all going to come out with the same cake. And if I gave us an assignment that next week I want you all to go home and follow this recipe, and we're going to bring our cakes back to church on Sunday next week. Now, don't come in here with a chocolate cake. Then somebody comes in, and they got sprinkles on their cake. Then somebody comes in, and they got icing on their cake. That's not in the recipe. Now, you say, well, why did you do that? Well, I like the way it tastes. It tastes good to me. Well, it may taste good to you. It may taste better to you, but that's not in the recipe. You see, any time we start adding things to the recipe, it's going to make the result become different. And the same thing when it comes to the word of God. You can't add anything to this because when you begin to add things, it makes the church look different. Now somebody says, well, well we all understand that you can't uh, create the cake if you just had sugar and eggs. But that's the way some people want to approach salvation. They say, well, I just want to believe and I want to be saved. Well, that's not, that's not how it works. You got to put it all together. It's not just belief that saves you. It's not just baptism that saves you. It's not just repentance that saves you and confession that saves you. It's all of it put together in obedience to the word of God. That's what saves us. Just like when we put this cake together, when we mix it all together, then that's how we come up with the result that we're looking for. So when it comes to the church, it is a divine institution ordained by God, and none of us have the right to make any changes to it. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It should all look the same. And that's the great thing about being in the Church of Christ. I moved to this area about a year ago. I came here, and I walked right in, and I was familiar with everything that was going on. Why? Because this church follows the word. You can go anywhere in the country and you could walk into a church of Christ that follows the Bible and they're all going to be doing the same thing. That's God's design. And we don't have a right to change it and make any additions to it or subtractions to it because it makes us feel good. Because we like it. So in my conclusion this morning, we look at the divine institution ordained by God. You got the family, you got the church, you got the government, but let's make some comparisons here. I want us to just quickly be aware of the fact that God compares the church to a family. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46, talking about Jesus and his family, and while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood outside desiring to speak to him. And one said unto him, behold, your mother and your brother stand outside and they want to speak with you. But Jesus answered and said unto them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. We are compared in the Bible as being a family. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have a Father who is a guide and a protector and a provider for everything that we need. Now, one thing about a family, is that uh, in order to be in a family, you have to be born into a family. You just can't get in a family. You gotta be born into the family or adopted into the family. And we understand that we must be born again in order to enter God's family. And the one thing about family 
is that we can never stop being family. Once you become family, you cannot uh, unborn yourself or, or not become a member of the family. Once you're in, you're in. And even if the members of the family are not acting the way you want them to act, we're still family. We're still brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you this one story here. Um, let me wrap up. There was a, a mother, and she had been teaching her two sons about Jesus. And she had been talking about the great sacrifice that Jesus made and that he was willing to, to give everything up for the salvation of the world. He was willing to go without so that others could have. And he gives the greatest example of what it means to sacrifice for one another. And so she had been teaching her sons that, and they seemed to be understanding. And uh, one morning when she was uh, cooking pancakes, uh, she only had one pancake left. And she said, boys, well, I got one pancake left. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? And so they're arguing, fighting over the pancake. I want the pancake. I want the pancake. No, I deserve it. And it's going back and forth. And so the mother thought to herself, this is a good opportunity to teach my children a lesson. And she says, boys, do you remember what I told you about Jesus? And they said, yes, yes, yes. And so then the, the younger son looked to his older brother. He says, you be Jesus. <laughs> right. You give me the pancake. So, but that's the way sometimes it is in the church, right? We got brothers and sisters, and they expect us to be Jesus while they do what they want to. But at the end, at the end of it all, you know, in all seriousness, at the end of it all, we, we're brothers and sisters, and we don't have the right to get rid of somebody out of the family. You know, what God teaches us we should do, we should forgive one another, just like you forgive your family. So, so we're all in this together. We all have like precious faith, and God says that we are a family. And so today, if you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to be a part of this family to be a part of the family of God. You can do that by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's really simple. Just as we talk, talked about making the cake, it's just that simple about being a Christian. We have to follow what's in the Bible. And the Bible teaches us that we must first believe that Jesus is the son of God. We must repent of our sins, that is change our lives. We must be willing to confess his name before men and baptize in water for the remissions of our sins. And if you do those things, you will be added to the family of God. And so the message is yours today. If there's anyone who needs to respond to the invitation, please do so as we stand and sing.